Thank you very much to the committee for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, in my work, I'm lucky enough to still manage to get out on farms, um, which makes this, this particular question of pertinence, because this is probably the one call that I still wake up in the middle of the night and curse and swear when I'm on my way to. So it would be nice to know when I have to put in a lot of effort and when I can uh, take things a little bit easier. As we know, uterine prolapse is a sporadic disease. Um, it's one that certainly in Norway has a, a large amount of interest from both veterinary surgeons and uh, farmers. And there are a large number of different treatment strategies uh, from amputation, emergency slaughter, um, also to simply replace the uterus. And then uh, some people like to use oxytocin, some people don't like to use oxytocin, some people use calcium and so on. And, and going through the literature, there seems to be a relative paucity of data on not only survival times of these animals after treatment, but also on the likelihood of success and the success of any particular treatment. So the objectives of the study were fairly simple. Um, we wanted to see if we could find any prognostic indicators which could be used by veterinary surgeons to predict the outcome of treatment before setting uh, uh, or commencing treatment to uh, find out if it would be better for the animal and better for the farmer and also the vet to um, perform euthanasia or emergency slaughter prior to treatment and also if we could identify any treatment strategies that were more successful than others. The sporadic nature of the disease makes it quite a challenging study to, to, uh, to quite a challenging disease to study. So we needed to gather data across a large area and a large number of farms. We did this through two questionnaires. Uh, one was a, a final year student project and the other was uh, part of a residency for the European College of Animal Reproduction. The first questionnaire, uh, we identified the 100 councils or council regions in Norway with the largest cattle population uh, and we selected the vets in each area, um, contacted them and asked them to submit data in one or more cases of uterine prolapse that they had through the spring calming season. And the second questionnaire, uh, we chose the five counties with the largest beef cattle populations. Uh, we took a convenient sample of the 23 vets that we thought we could twist the arm off to uh, get, get them to help our study. Um, and as a bit of a payback for their help, and for the, we also offered to analyze some, uh, some data for some blood samples for them free of charge, looking at, at uh, metabolites and, and uh, macro minerals. Once we'd collected the data uh, from the questionnaires, we uh, cross-referenced them to both the Norwegian Dairy Herd Recording System and the Norwegian Beef Herd Recording System. These are very well-established data recording systems in Norway with around 90 or over 90% of the, the dairy herd voluntarily uh, registers data there and approaching 90% of the beef herd now registers data there. This is partly a legal requirement, uh, fulfills all of the legal um, uh, births, deaths, register of cattle, but also it's uh, been a great, a great tool to, to uh, record production data and also now more recently treatment data. We use these databases to identify breed parity, uh, calving dates, and double check that the data we received from the farmers was accurate and uh, dates that the animals left the herd, be it for slaughter or, or culling. We merged the data sets, uh, used basic descriptive st statistics. Um, the unit of study for, our, for this work was lactation. Uh, we modeled with uh, Cox proportional hazard, hazard techniques and the outcome was uh, the time to culling from, uh, from the event. The start day was, was def defined as the day of the prolapse, which of course in practice is the is the day of calving. And we set all of the analysis with a stop day of, of 30 days. So the aim of this was to really just see which of these animals were we, manage, were we managing to get over the, uh, the kind of acute critical period of this disease. We applied a frailty model for the variability farm to, to account for on-farm on -farm individual variation. <coughs> So we were lucky enough to 
Gavin, 92 cases from the first questionnaire. We had 57 willing uh, veterinary surgeons, and uh, we got 34 cases from 22 surgeons in the, in the, uh, in the second questionnaire. So in total, we had 124 ca 126 cases. Two of these uh, had uh, missing data. We couldn't identify the survival time of the animals, so we dropped that. Uh, um, correction or, or some form of treatment was performed in 96% of the cases, in 96 cases. Of those, uh, of, of those sorry, <laughs> 96. Yeah, correction was performed in 96 cases, meant that, which meant that 28 were uh, culled immediately. In the questionnaire, we uh, asked vets to assess a, a variety of things. Uh, clinical impression of the animal was one. So did, we, did the veterinary surgeon consider the animal to be in a, in a good, uh, suboptimal or poor state um, based on the fact that it had a, a uterine prolapse? Uh, we also asked details of treatment, um, time, time from calving to replacing the prolapse, where that was known, uh, approximate time that the veterinary surgeon used to, um, to replace the prolapse or treat the cow, uh, and methods used. So had they used uterine sutures, had they treated with any medicines, uh, had they used any aids to facilitate the replacement of the uterus. We found that in general, the dairy cows were perceived to be in a worse clinical condition than the beef cows by the veterinary surgeons. The cows in the worst clinical impression were less likely to be treated, which is probably isn't so surprising. And that beef cows were more likely to be treated after, after we'd correct, than dairy cows after we'd corrected for the factor of clinical impression. And again, that's not really a surprise if we think about the, the model and the value of the beef cow. So when we moved on to our results, um, first, first aim of this was to try and identify simple, straightforward predictors um, to see if we could uh, decide shall we or shall we not begin to replace the uterus. So we looked at the dairy breeds compared to the beef breeds. The dairy breeds in this case are dual purpose Norwegian red cows entirely, um, so not, not Holsteins. Uh, we found there was, there was no difference there. No, we were no more likely to survive or die after replacement, uh, but at least by day 30, if you were a beef or a dairy cow. Parity also wasn't a factor. Uh, we saw in the study the, the fairly common split where beef animals, most of the, uh, most of the um, animals affected by uterine prolapse, in, or a higher proportion, were heifers or primipyrus animals in the beef sector and older animals in the dairy sector. But again, we found no correlation or between survival times. Clinical impression. Uh, if the veterinary surgeon identified the animal as being in a poor condition, uh, their overall subjective, opi uh, subjective opinion was the animal was in a poor state, then that, thankfully for us and for, uh, for our profession, uh, turned out to be a very good indicator. So if your, if your gut feeling was this isn't going to work, the chances were the animal was, was going to have a higher risk, of, higher risk of dying. We also looked to see the animals, if standing animals, animals that, and lying animals, if that had any effect. And we were moving towards a slight tendency, but we didn't get that far. So we have to say there was no difference there between standing or recumbent animals. This is just the, the Kaplan-Meier plot, just to show the the fairly clear difference between the, uh, between the animals here that were considered to be in a suboptimal or good clinical condition relative to the fact that they had uh, uterine prolapse and those that were defined by the veterinary surgeon to be a poor clinical position, clinical impression. So you see there's a very, very high drop off in the first one to two days of those animals and considerable higher risk of, uh, of uh, death. We're also interested to see what sort of effects um, concurrent diseases or previous diseases had. Could we find any, uh, any of these variables? So we investigated uh, previous vaginal prolapse in the, in the, throughout the pregnancy, uh, incidence of dystochia, milk fever, um, and uh, we, we didn't manage to find any of those, uh, any of those factors significant. 
treatment results. One of the interesting factors of the study, which, we, which I'm not really going to use time on now, was uh, we got to see a cross-section of, of what uh, 80 vets decided to do or, and how they treated these cases. And the vast majority of them all gave epidurals. Um, and a, a lesser number gave uh, calcium. There were some of these animals received um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and absolutely the most of them received oxytocin. But again, the choice of these treatments or not had absolutely no impact on, uh, on the risk of, on the risk of uh, survival. Interestingly, in these times where we should be mentioning antibiotics, there was about a 50-50 split in, in, in antibiotic usage. Half of the cows were treated with antibiotics, half of the cows weren't treated with antibiotics. Some intrauterine antibiotics, some were treated uh, by injection. Um, but we saw no difference in, in uh, treatment results there either. When we came to a, f a few of the other variables, did we try to see, was it, was it effective to use, for example, a bottle uh, to, to help fully extend the uterus? Um, that was very frequently used. We now found no, uh, no difference between those that, that had or hadn't used. If the vet themselves had, had perceived that they'd fully replaced the uterus uh, uh, and they were very confident that it was sitting, sitting well, that also had very little to do with uh, risk of survival and time to replace. We split the data and saw if you took more than half an hour or less than half an hour to replace it and we saw a tendency to an effect here or an almost tendency, but again, absolutely no, um, no confident significant difference. I was personally very interested to see about the use of vaginal sutures or not, but all, all, uh, all apart from three cases did, uh, were sutured in the vulval lips at the, end of, uh, at the end of the procedure, so we didn't have any, enough data to, to look at that. So somewhat disappointingly, the, uh, the, re the, the results led to the conclusions that the absolute most important thing is the subjective clinical judgment of the veterinary surgeon in the field. If, uh, if we or, or they don't think that it's going to work, in all likelihood, it's not going to work. So we probably should trust our, trust our gut, gut feelings and perform euthanasia or emergency slaughter, depending on the regulations in your country. We found, at least in this relatively small sample size of just over or just under 100 animals that were, that were treated, that concurrent disease wasn't an important factor. Now, it might well be that some of the animals that were culled immediately had concurrent disease, but of those that were treated, once that decision had been made, concurrent disease had very little effect. Um, we saw there was still considerable variation in the different treatment protocols veterinary surgeons employ. And of course, if any of these factors do have a result uh, and, and logic and uh, perhaps the data also indicate that there's, we're on our way to getting a tendency, then we would need to perform larger studies to, to get to this. And that's something through the, uh, through the recording systems in Norway now, um, medicine recordings have been, uh, uh, have been introduced down to the animal level combined with diagnosis. So that's something that we might be able to look at in, uh, in future years. Thank you very much for your attention.